by the late Professor Emeritus Harold Isaacs. Professor Isaac served as a history professor at Georgia Southwestern State for 49 years. During his tenure at GSW, Professor Isaacs taught courses in Latin American history, African American history, and established minors in Black Studies and Third World Studies. In 1981, he launched the Third World in Perspective seminar series and two years later, he established the Association of Third World Studies. In 1984, the Journal of Third World Studies followed. This journal addressed the problems and issues facing less developed countries all over the world. Following Professor Isaac's death in 2015, the name of the journal was changed to the Journal of Global South Studies and is published by the University of Florida on behalf of the now named Association of Global South Studies. As part of his bequest to GSW, Professor Isaacs requested that part of the monies he donated each year be used to bring a guest speaker to campus to talk to the campus community about the issues and the opportunities facing the Global South. Tonight, I'm happy to introduce Professor Ashish Adhikari Professor Adhikari has his master's in international relations and business administration. He has been on the faculty of the Presidential Business School and is working on his doctorate at the Institute of South Cooperation and Development at Peking University. Currently, he is a consultant for the Policy Research Institute, which is a government owned think tank in Nepal. After Professor Adhikari concludes his presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask him a few questions. Professor Adkahari, we're turning it over to you now. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor Boni. Uh, good morning from uh, Nepal and good evening to all the students and uh, professors from Georgia Southwest University. Uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. So shall we move ahead? Absolutely, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about the dynamics of US-China relations. Uh, it, it has been a hot topic in the recent months after all the ups and downs going on between these two countries. I've done a level of analysis for you students to understand that a specific approach or specific understanding is not sufficient in academic studies. We need to understand, we need to understand it from a broad level of uh, analysis. So shall, shall we move ahead, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is the structure of the presentation. Uh, first, I've just highlighted the chronology of US-China relations. We will not be discussing about it in details in today's class. Uh, it's just just something for you to uh, understand uh, uh, for, for your future. And uh, existing narratives, theoretical outlooks, and the framework for the analysis. Uh, in today's study, the framework I would be using would be individual, state, and system level. There will be three different levels of analysis to understand the US-China relations. I'll talk about it uh, in details in the upcoming slides. And I would, we would con conclude either the US-China relations are converging or diverging in this changed environment. And what would be the way ahead and uh, how the developing and least developed world sees these relations, how it, how it would impact uh, these, uh, the third world. Uh, that's, that's the whole structure of the presentation. Uh, I think it would take around 50 to 55 minutes to finish this presentation. Perfect. So let's begin. This is, this is the list of events. It starts from 1971 through ping pong diplomacy. We all remember Nixon and, uh, and his visit to China. Actually, I, I have not talked about uh, the incidents before that. Uh, and uh, from 2017, the post-Trump era and US-China relations, this, this is just, just a chronology of events uh, for, for you to just refresh how US-China relations has been moving up on. So now, 
the existing narratives. Basically, there are three narratives on U.S.-China relations. Uh, they are Thucydides' trap, the next Cold War, and decoupling. So by Thucydides' war, uh, the uh, propounder of this narrative believes that uh, uh, when there is an existing power and there is an emerging power, like existing power, there is United States, and when China is emerging and an existing power, there is high probability of a physical war between those countries. So he has studied 16 such cases and he has found out that 12 of them has resulted in a physical war. So the, the basic narrative uh, propagated by Allison was, uh, could US and China avoid that society the strap in which eventually they will go into a physical warfare. So in Asian Greece, Greece, Athens and Sparta were the examples and Germany also threatened, threatened the unipolarity of Britain and it ended into a war. So it's one of the narrative that's going on right now uh, in the US-China relations. The second narrative is the next Cold War. It believes that there won't be a physical warfare between these two countries, but there will be ideological differences and there would be proxy wars. The proxy war could happen in, in different geographies. It might happen in the issue of North Korea and South Korea, where a particular power supports a particular country, or it might happen between Israel and Iran, or India and Pakistan. So it's not a physical war between the United States. It will not be a physical war between the United States and China, but they will participate in the wars between other two countries for their allies. So it's, it's the idea of Cold War is basically based on the the historical relations between United States and USSR, Soviet Russia during the 1950s. And the third idea, the third narrative going on is decoupling, decoupling between the United States and uh, China. Actually, this is quite strong narrative going on right now. Decoupling means disengagement between United States and China in the economic front. Actually, the underlying idea behind decoupling is that uh, when Nixon visited China and when President Nixon engaged with uh, engaged United States with China, the, the basic assumption was that the economic liberalization of China through America's engagement will gradually bring political liberalization in China. But the results we all could see, the results are quite different. The economic liberalization has happened, but the political liberalization is quite far away. They still, uh, communi the Communist Party of China got more stronger and China itself as a country uh, become st stronger and developed exponentially. So there are believers, there are uh, theorists who believe that the engagement policy did not work. So now the United States should start to decouple with China in the economic front. And tariff, and technology, and trade war, all of those are the, the results of those failed engagement policy. So it's basically three narratives that's going on right now between the United States and China relations. Now let's talk about the theoretical outlook. I'll not, I'll not explain in detail about the theoretical outlook. Uh, there are three schools of thought that, that, that is helpful on looking at US-China relations. Uh, they are the structural conflict schools, institutional school, and there is a domestic school. For the, structure, uh, for the structural conflict school, they, they believe that the problem between the United States and China is structural. That is the differences of power between those two, those two countries. Uh, are, and they are the hardliners. They believe that uh, China should retaliate, China should countervail every action taken by the United States. So containment and encircle, they believe that United States policy is to contain China and is to encircle China. That's one theoretical outlook of looking at uh, uh, US-China relations. Another theoretical outlook is the institutional conflict school. They believe that it's not structural. The problem is not structural. Rather, the problem is more institutional. This school believes that the major factors regarding the rifts between United States and China is institutional. There are institutional differences between United States and China in the front of politics and in the front of economy. The political system is different and economic organization is also different. China believes in a state-facilitated economic system, whereas uh, United States believes in a free market, in the freedom of market. But this school is quite uh, silent uh, regarding the political institution. It talks a lot about institutional, econo uh, sorry, economic institutions, but it's quite silent regarding the political institutions and differences between United States and China in the political front. So 
but this school is carried out by the negotiators they are not carried out by hardliners you know they call hawkish and dovish in international relations so this school is carried out by dovish they don't believe in hawkish activities they don't believe in countervailing so they think that you know china should deepen more market economy it should deepen its market economy more it should open up more and it should cooperate more with other countries in the economic front so they are some sort of negotiators rather than the hardliners and the third school is the UA. they they believe that the problems that that has been uh, this the, the rift between us and china relations is because of the domestic issues of united states of america they think that the 2008 financial crisis has brought a lot of internal domestic issues in united states of america that's employment trade deficit inequality to count some of them and these domestic issues for to manage these domestic issues united states needs an external enemy to blame for and china is there to to be blamed for because the political and economic system of china contradicts with united states values so its school is kind of accusation to united states that it's it's basically exporting its problems to china so these are the theoretical outlooks regarding the us and china relations that that are quite popular in these days in uh, in papers and and even in interviews and media so let's move ahead to our part of the analysis then now what what we will do today is we will do a level of analysis we will do a three level of analysis uh, we will do individual level of analysis state level of analysis and systemic level of analysis at the individual level how individual presidents outlook toward global affairs and us china relations has been impacted that's what we are going to look at the individual level president trump's president xi's outlook is considered for this presentation uh for this presentation and at the state level i have highlighted the political and economic political and economic systems of two countries i would be briefly i would be concentrating on the role of congress in case of united states and communist party of china in case of china in the state level of analysis and at the systemic level of analysis we will talk about how power is distributed in international system in today's world and how regional and global affairs are looked upon by united states and china so these are three different level of analysis which will help us to reach a conclusion what's happening exactly between united states and china i think individual level of analysis is not sufficient to understand us china relations it's important but it's not sufficient so let's move ahead with the individual level at the individual level uh we'll first talk about president trump's outlook toward uh, toward international relations toward toward china and towards foreign policy so what uh, trump has actually done president trump had actually done his uh, the most important thing he has done is he has brought front the idea of america first there are certain uh, examples that justify how he has enacted this idea of america first the first one is trade war a protectionist economy in which he applied tariff not only to china but also to india and other countries trump applied this this uh, this tariff war gradually escalated into a technological war and uh, boycotting technology of each other's country and which gradually evolved into a trade war so china also released its position through a white paper in this issue in this case in this issue another uh, another example to justify america first was an order signed by president trump which was called buy america and hire america so it has two different areas to touch upon the first area was regarding the domestic production of united states and the second area quite important area was immigration uh, president trump was quite uh, reluctant and he, and he believed that the workers from abroad to usa should be governed and administered so that's how that's why he applied this uh, buy and hire america uh, order he signed that uh, he he believed that it is necessary to develop american economic system and generate more jobs for the american people so we are not here talking about what's good and what's bad i'm just trying to highlight the examples that that will help us understand how uh, president trump uh, 
floated this idea of America first. So NAFTA trade deal is another example in which uh, uh, President Trump replaced the NAFTA, NAFTA trade deal uh, with Mexico uh, and uh, Canada. He assumed that it will create 600,000 more jobs and add $235 billion in the US economy. So his uh, America first economy was not only constrained to legal immigrants, but to restrain illegal immigrants as well. We all know about that popular wall between United States and Mexico. And uh, one, of the, one of the first examples regarding America first by Donald Trump could be understood if we study his speech to the 75th UNGA that happened recently in the United Nations General Assembly. His speech argues that the global ambitions of United States are due to the cost of American people. So the main underlying idea is that President Trump believes United States global ambition and global presence are incurring costs to, United, to the people of the United States. That's, that's how propagates this idea of America first. So the second uh, important thing that uh, President Trump has done is that he has made his allies uncertain. There are three examples that I'll talk about regarding this point. The first one is Iran nuclear deal. In May 2008, President Trump announced that he will drop out from the Iran deal and declared a highest level of sanctions to Iran. So this deal was done by P5 plus one, P5 permanent five members of United, United Nations Security Council and Germany. It, it was collectively applied to Iran by them. So you know, it created a kind of a, a dissatisfaction and kind of uncertainty towards the consistency of United States policy in global affairs. So it's very important. It created it, it, it created uncertainty towards the allies of United United States. Another important aspect was the NATO regarding NATO. President Trump believed that the European allies are not paying their fair share in case of security uh, uh, security organization of NATO. So he said that he would bring out away the troops from uh, Germany if the Germany do, does not pay a fair share. So it created a form of uncertainty between uh, uh, United States and its allies. And another important example is North Korean talks. North Korean talks uh, also raised concern towards American allies like South Korea and Japan. These talks undermined American belief towards democracy and denuclearization of North Korea because the talk itself was very important, but the idea of denuclearization and the idea of democracy, that's the principal values of United States was never discussed, was, was not so important in the forefront discussion. So it created a kind of uncertainty and a kind of uh, uh, uncertainty to the allies of United States. So the third important aspect of President Trump's uh, uh, presidency was uh, irresponsible global leadership. I have used this word irresponsible because uh, he broke away from the pacts that United States has already been done. So at, from a state's uh, point of view, it was quite irresponsible uh, uh, enactment. That's, that's what I believe. So basically, I'll give two examples. The World Health Organization, uh, when President Trump decided to cut ties with World Health Organization, and uh, which will be applied from 2021 AD. So he also said that United States will not participate in the COVAX uh, project. Uh, he he accused that it's 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 not a good project. He said that it's. Uh, uh, the COVAX project is basically about COVID-19 vaccine development, manufacturing and distribution done by the World Health Organization. So, and another important aspect of his uh, bounce back from the global affairs was uh, the Paris Climate Accord, in which uh, uh, he, he criticized 195 countries around the world and said that uh, it will harm American economy and American citizens. So basically, I'm not trying to argue with it, whether it's a, it was a good decision or a bad decision, but uh, what I'm going to argue is what kind of uh, results did it create? At first, it created uncertain allies. It created a vacant global leadership. So that's the two important thing that Donald Trump's presidency did in international, uh, from the perspective of international relations. It, it vacuumed the international leadership and it created uncertainty, uncertainty among friends. And to go to a personal front, personal characteristics, we all uh, know how vocal and outspoken President Trump was. His uh, use of strong words like China virus has, was so popular. And uh, 
you know it's it, it is not uh, regarded as uh, as uh, as a quote unquote good it's not regarded as good to use such strong words in diplomatic communication and diplomatic affairs anyways these foreign endeavors and diplomatic endeavors of trump created a global vacuum the allies were dissatisfied with the united states and they were uncertain what president trump will enact in a particular issue besides the trust of the allies toward united states also minimized as trump rhetorized america first it developed populism culture where results were not primary to the blame game and it used the very strong languages and blaming languages so this is what it basically this is what basically happened in his presidency there was a global vacuum and there were unhappy friends so let's move toward uh, president c so you know you can see an interaction between these two presidents uh, individuals between these uh, uh, between the outlooks of these two presidents so president what president c did some move, some move, some important uh, aspects of president c's uh, presidency where was he moved the country towards a centralization in two facets the centralization was in two facets the first facet was he ended the limitations on the term of president of uh, china so basically he has centralized the power to himself as the president of china and he also brought the chinese communist party to the center of chinese governance and international affairs actually the role of party in chinese governance has always been a very uh, important aspects from very long period of time it is believed that uh, deng xiaoping was the one who who brought front the the bureaucracy in the in the in the uh, affairs of china in the global and uh, domestic affairs of china but uh, it is believed that uh, president xi has again brought forward the poly, the chinese communist party into the forefront of uh, uh, domestic and international affairs of china so how he did that was there are uh, there are small groups within chinese communist parties they call it leading small groups they are export groups and uh, they are called lsg leading small groups and they are considered supra ministerial level supra ministerial level and they coordinate between two ministries they coordinate between two ministries so uh, president uh, uh, c uh, activated these uh, small groups uh, in a large context i think he, he himself leads six or seven groups important groups and uh, one of the more most important group is the uh, opening up and the reformation of china he leads that as well so basically he revived this uh, small groups uh, within the political system of chinese communist party and brought it forefront uh, in the global and domestic affairs of china so that's what he did is did was he centralized polit communist uh, chinese uh, uh, communist party of china and himself as the central power of chinese governance and chinese international affairs so the next act aspect uh, of xi jinping was president xi was a re rejuvenation of chinese people it's it's basic it basically means that historically after the opium war and japanese invasion uh, the chinese people faced a great humiliation it's been the china was china itself con considered itself as the center center of the earth for a long period of time and after opium war and japanese invasion it is believed that they 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 call it a humiliation a chinese humiliation so see president xi believes in bringing back the legacy of a powerful china the rejuvenation is also linked with taiwan which believes taiwan is a part of china linking peoples of china and taiwan hong kong security law can also be considered as an example of rejuvenation which xi has president xi has officially ended one state two system approach of china so basically rejuvenation of china is bringing china to the front again reviving the legacy of a powerful china so the third important part is xi jinping's thoughts in xi jinping's thought socialism with chinese characteristics in the new era actually socialism with chinese characteristics is a, is not a new terminology it's not a new phrase it has been used uh, by by most of the leaders of china but uh, what xi jinping's thought is uh, there are a lot of aspects of xi jinping's thoughts but something that's quite important for today's class we'll just this we'll just discuss about that so the the basic idea of xi jinping's thought is making china great again it actually differs from the low profile approach of china and believe believes in projecting leadership on a global stage so basically xi jinping's thought is 
there are a lot of things in Xi Jinping's thoughts related to education, uh, health, and economy, and those kind of uh, areas. But uh, the one of the fundamental thing that we'll talk, we'll look at from the perspective of international relations today is Xi Jinping believes that it's time for China to project a global leadership at a global stage. So it contradicts with Deng Xiaoping's low profile attitude of China. And so Xi Jinping's China is not a sublime reactionary China, but it's a rule maker. It's a proactive and a participatory China. So that's the fundamental departure from the existing uh, leadership and existing beliefs. So that's why Xi Jinping is important in Chinese international affairs. So if we interact with these two presidential outlooks, so we'll understand that President uh, Trump's uh, vacant global leadership and President Xi's aspiring China. You know, you can see the interaction now. The, President Trump created a vacuum in the international system and President Xi believes that it's time for China to move ahead. So there is an interaction. So now let's, uh, let's talk about uh, where does President Biden differ? Uh, after his uh, recent uh, win. So President Biden uh, differs in a, a lot of areas, but three important aspects that I will be talking about today is reinforcing of American diplomacy. It basically means that unlike Trump, Biden will prioritize liberal values and democracy as a core of international relations. So it's basically he'll prioritize the liberal values, human rights and freedoms related to uh, as, as a core of American uh, approach toward international affairs. It, it, uh, and the second one is a review of global leadership. As I said earlier, uh, President uh, Trump's uh, activities uh, has made the global uh, system vacant, has fade away United States from the global system. Now he, President Biden believes that United States should go back to that leadership again. So he will be taking charge of the global leadership and uh, restore and reimagine re partnerships. It basically means that it will create a strong alliance between the United States and its allies. So it will try to end that mistrust and uncertainty that has been developed between these two, between the United States and its allies. So it's basically quite opposite to what uh, 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 President Trump would do. Uh, it will fulfill the global vacuum. It might fulfill the global vacuum. We, we still have to see that it might fulfill the global vacuum. It will bring America's core values at the core and it will create a trusting ally. So you can see the interaction, right? President Trump uh, vacuum, President Xi aspired China and now President Biden. How, how, will, how will it impact the, uh, the relationship between the United States and China? We'll talk about it in detail in the, in the concluding slides. So let's move to the state level. In the state level, I'll talk about how United States sees Chinese political, economic, and some strategic affairs, and how China retaliates, how China looks back, how China answers to those approaches of United States. So regarding the political ideology, China and USA vary in their political ideology. USA advocates Chinese political system as authoritarian and wishes to gradually democratize, democratize Chinese political system. You know, recently, United States Congress has introduced an act. It's called City of Act, China Task Force Act, which believes to enact a comprehensive legislative response to the threats posed by Chinese Communist Party to United States and to freedom, human rights, and democracy around the world. So basically, how United States see Chinese political system is it is a threat to United States and to democracy, freedom, to core American values. It's a threat to core American values and United States. So. The, it's how political ideology differs. It's how United States approaches political uh, ideology of uh, China. And the second point is regarding sovereignty and territorial integrity. In this part, I'll talk about the three strategic areas, three important areas. It's Tibet, it's Hong Kong, and it's Taiwan. United States recently passed an act called, introduced, uh, related with Tibet. I think it was, it's called uh, Free Tibet Act or something like that. So which believes that, which envisions Tibet as a free and independent country. So which really, it strongly contradicts how United, how China looks at Tibet. So you know, United States sees Tibet as a free and independent country. Similarly, United States Congress also introduced a Taiwan Reinforcement Act. So it is a state level, so we'll talk about Act and Congress in this part a bit more. So it talks about the Taiwan Reinforcement Act, which says that one China policy and one China principles are different. They are not same. 
So basically, what United States is trying to say that uh, United States legally might differ in one China principle, although it applies one China policy. So it's 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 only a policy. It's not a principle of United States. That's what written in that act. And similarly, United States is also shows a great concern over Taiwan Strait and the aggression and forceful enactment of China toward China, Taiwan Strait would be seen as a grave concern to United States of America. That's what written in the act. So it means that uh, all the strategic areas uh, of China, United States is concerned over those areas. United States has shown concern over, the, over those areas. Similar has happened in the Hong Kong uh, related issue. Uh, the Hong Kong uh, Security Act or something, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the full name of the act, but it's related to Hong Kong. It's Hong Kong Security Act or something like that. It, it's, it's just uh, introduced in the Congress. And it says that uh, Chinese uh, National Security Act of Hong Kong is severely against the one China two system policy. The one China two system basically means that uh, China itself uh, applies a communist uh, system within the mainland China and Hong Kong as a part of China. There is a democratic system in Hong Kong. So it's, it, it is called one state two system in China. It has been practiced since long, but uh, recent uh, uh, Chinese uh, National security law of Hong Kong is kind uh, is kind of trying to end that one China two system policy. So, USC is developing laws which directly confronts with sovereign and territorial issues of China. So, so China considered these issues as sovereignty as the issues of sovereignty and territorial integrity, and United States is is concerned about those issues. The third point is political influence. We are talking about political ideologies and political systems. Uh, between the United States and China at the state level. USA has also introduced a law called Countering Chinese Influence Act. Countering Chinese Influence Act. You can see the name itself says a lot of things. Countering Chinese Influence Act, which directs the United States State Department to act against the Chinese communist campaigns against to corrupt domestic countries and undermine domestic institutions. So basically it's 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 a, a uh, it's a rift between values. It's a rift between values between United States and China. And the United States believes that a ch Chinese way of looking at the international affairs and Chinese political system will corrupt you know, uh, the, the values. It's, it's against and it's not legitimate. It's against the values carried by United States as a country. So let's move to religious freedom. Religious freedom is uh, it's related to we all might have heard uh, Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province of China. It's it's hot debate right now. So this act it's a human uh, Uyghur human rights policy act. I think it has already been passed. It's already a law now. It believes that this act has already passed and it sees China a uh, Chinese action against the human rights principles against human rights principles towards the Uyghur Muslims. And it also sanctions very high-level Chinese uh, leaders, political leaders. It, it's quite important. Uh, I think uh, this law sanctions two, two high-level leaders, uh, party secretary of Xinjiang province and former party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region. So it, it's very important. These things are very important because you know United States and China relations are not just official. A lot of politicians, uh, 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 children go and study in each other's country. Basically, the, uh, from China to United States, they go and study there. So, sanctioning high-level political uh, uh, leaders, it, it's, uh, it will have a very strong uh, effect on the whole political system of China. So, it, it's a tool, that's what I'm trying to say. So, United States also differs in the economic system of China. So, here you can understand how United States looks at the political and economic system and certain strategic issues related to China. Now let's let's understand how China retaliates, how China answers to those approaches taken by United States. The first one is regarding political legitimacy. China, China believes that the political system of China is obviously different than the United States, but it's based on Confucian's idea of meritocracy. It's not like the electoral dem democracy, but it's based on selection and then election. It believes that it's a meritocratic system. China itself has been has uh, emphasized itself as a meritocratic country, and it continues uh, if uh, it continues uh, pros if continuous uh, sorry uh, I was on political system yeah. and uh, China believes that it's it is based on the political merito uh, sorry Confucian meritocracy 
they uh, they believe that the electoral system as selecting least merit the electoral system will select the least least merit but chinese system is on only a capable leader can reach the top because in the Chinese political system, the leader has to walk in different villages, different provinces, and different regions before they move into a, the into the central position. So it's 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 not an easy task for the Chinese uh, leaders. But and Chinese argue that in a, in a democratic electoral system, anyone can win. Uh, it, uh, it's not uh, true to 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 a large extent. But we have seen examples where uh, inexperienced and uh, uh, Populist people have won elections in the world, so you know it's, it, it's, it, it makes sense as well. So, uh, the, so this is how uh, China answers the political uh, approach of United States. And uh, uh, regarding legitimacy of Chinese Communist Party, China argues that the, le the, the legitimacy of Chinese political party resides on the continuous prosperity of Chinese people. We have seen that in 40 years period of time, China has done uh, a remarkable job in terms of development and uh, quote unquote economic development and prosperity. So Chinese argue that uh, that gives them legitimacy, that gives legitimacy to the Chinese uh, Communist Party to be on power. Uh, uh, this is how they answer the legitimacy argument raised by United States. And, Although you see Chinese political system and party as a threat, the Chinese people has long legitimized their political system because uh, the Chinese, they believe that the, the Chinese political system are able to make their people happy. So that's that's the, how they, they argue, that's how they put their point. So and another aspect is Chinese nationalism. Chinese nationalism also joins the Chinese people the rejuvenation of Chinese nation with Taiwan and Hong Kong has provided a political legitimacy to Chinese political leadership as well. So these issues are quite important because the, the Chinese uh, Communist Party carry, gains legitimacy from the idea of Chinese nationalism and the rejuvenation of uh, Chinese nations. So you can see you know, how, how United States sees the political system of China and how China answers those uh, uh, approaches and those beliefs of United, United States. So, so that, that is the reason I kept it on the state level of analysis. And uh, regarding the strategic issues that we discussed earlier regarding Tibet, ta Taiwan, uh, Tibet, Taiwan, Xinjiang, uh, Uyghur Muslims of uh, Xinjiang and Hong Kong, uh, China strongly opposes those activities. China, the, uh, China strongly opposes Tibet activities of United States and China says the Xinjiang issue is an interference for in international affairs. So what the point here I'm trying to make is that uh, the, there are divergences, there are differences between United States and China at the state level as well. So individual level itself is not sufficient to analyze these relations. And the most, uh, let's come to the economic front. Uh, I think uh, at the economic front, uh, the relationships are quite different. Uh, the recent acts of activities of China, they have opened up their financial market. I think they opened up in April of 2019 and uh, they have allowed uh, uh, United States to invest, the companies of United States to invest in their stock market. So they are gradually opening up their economy to United States. So I think at the economic front, they are trying to engage with United States. But at the political and strategic front, they are quite reluctant. They do not agree with the ideas and the values propagated by United States. So this state level is important because, you know, it's not about the differences in political and uh, strategic issues. Uh, United States is uh, working on institutionalizing the differences between United States and China through the parliamentary process. That's the important part. So that, that's why I kept it on the state level of analysis. It's not uh, about what uh, individual uh, things or, or what individual leader thinks. Uh, United States is making laws regarding Taiwan, regarding Tibet, regarding Hong Kong, and uh, regarding Muslims, uh, human rights, and regarding Chinese aggression, Chinese uh, uh, political system. So it means that United States is institutionalizing those, uh, those areas. By institutionalizing, I mean that they are trying to create a synonymity among the peoples of United States on how to look at China. So it, it will not be, a, after it becomes a law, it's, it's, it's a very, it will be a very 
less chances that it will be opposed by a particular party or it will be opposed by a particular leader because you know uh, after the congress uh, makes it a law it will be it will be on by all the political parties because all republicans and uh, democrats are present in the congress so the the, the main idea behind it is united states uh, it, it's not uh, trying to develop the approach towards china as an individual of uh, individual uh, level it's trying to institutionalize it uh, through legal uh, systems it's trying to make it a law so that's that's quite important So if you have any queries, uh, shall we discuss this at the end, right? Professor Bonnie, is it fine if we discuss it at the end or are they allowed to ask questions in the middle? Uh, they could, if somebody has a question now that they want to ask, I was thinking we would save most of the questions till the end, but if there's anybody who has any questions or comments right now, because this has been a lot, does anybody have anything they want to ask before we continue? Or would you all prefer to wait till the end? Sure. Sure. Uh, Mark, were you going to say something? I would prefer to wait till the end. You'd rather wait till, okay. We're going to go ahead and wait till the end, Professor. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's go to the system level. In the, in the system level, we'll talk about uh, the polarity, the differences in power between, uh, in the international system, how that power is, uh, uh, decimated in the national system. So uh, regarding the polarity, for a long period of time, the international system remained unipolar, and uh, especially after the end of uh, USSR. So now China has uh, risen as an, as an emerging power and seeking its role in regional and global affairs. China seeks its role in regional and global affairs. However, USA already remains in that position. So will the United States share its power with China? That's, that's a fundamental uh, area of discussion. So if if United States doesn't want to share its power with China, then basically uh, confrontation is uh, unavoidable. There will definitely be some confrontations. So it uh, basically def uh, depends on the polarity of international system as well. So it's a systemic level of analysis. And uh, another important aspect of system level is the security dilemma. This is a condition in which countries are unsure about their security and they run for power through arms race or alliancing. They do arms race or alliancing to maintain power uh, within, uh, within themselves, to remain in that powerful position. The same security dilemma is seen in different regions. Basically in the South China Sea, after the Chinese presence in South China Sea, Japan and South Korea, the allies of United States, they, they, they felt this security dilemma and United States has to jump in in that area. Region. So, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is in, 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 in the specific regions, uh, there is a specific policy, there is a specific way uh, China moves and the uh, United States has to come there. And in another region, United States move and China has to come there. So it's, uh, it's creating a kind of a dilemma. It's, creating a, it, it's because of kind of security dilemma in those regions. And when those two powerful countries uh, reach there, what will happen is another discussion, but they are not there in a cooperation. They are not there for a cooperation, that's for sure. So the most important aspect that I'll talk about, that I'll talk about it on the next slide is Indo-Pacific strategy and maritime silk route. I'll, I'll brief it uh, a bit in the next slide. And uh, let's, let's move to international institutions. You know, even in the international institutions, there is a difference in the formation of international institutions. Uh, it is believed that AIIB, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, it is believed to oppose this influence of World Bank and Asian Development Bank. So that, that's why it was formed. That is, that is normally argued. And similarly, the debt provided by Belt and Road, the Road Initiative Project is also controversial and some scholars define it as a debt trap strategy of China. And the United States MCC, Millennium, Millennium Challenge Corporation is considered as a tool to call BRI project. So what, are, what I'm trying to say is, you know, United States builds a policy for a particular region or a particular institution, and there is China, which comes in with uh, with a, with a similar kind of aspirations and similar kind of policies in the same area, and and vice versa in case of China and United States as well. So, uh, it would not have happened if they would have cooperated in some areas, in certain areas. So, this these are the symptoms of divergences. These are the symptoms of rifts rifts at the systemic level. That's what I'm trying to argue, and. Uh, 
And one important aspect is the military has superseded diplomacy, especially in last four to five years, especially in regions of South China Sea, in Indian Ocean, the military has uh, uh, superseded diplomacy. Diplomacy is not so strong. The international organization is not so strong. They are not able to provide platforms for leaders to talk and the military has superseded. These are the signs at the systemic level, which we, mu we must consider uh, while doing the analysis of the United States and China. So this is basically the slide that I was discussing uh, beforehand. It's about the Indo-Pacific strategy and Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road Initiative is a flag project of China in which it believes to connect with the different countries of the world, in which it believes to differ connect with the different countries of the world. In the left picture, you can see the Maritime Silk Route. It's a blue dotted link which connects the eastern part of China, southeastern and eastern part of China with uh, South Asia in Colombo, Kolkata and in Nairobi of Kenya. It means in Africa. So through Africa, it goes to uh, all the way to Europe. So you can see on the right hand side, uh, it's the same area that also has been uh, uh, under, under the interest of United States. So you can see the, the, the blue shaded area. So, you know, the, the, the fundamental question that we should uh, consider is why these two countries have two different strategies in the same region? Why they don't have the same strategy? Because they are, they are not cooperating. If they would have cooperated, if they, ha if they would have discussed, if they would have sat down and discussed uh, regarding these, uh, these issues and these reasons, they would have come up with the same, uh, with a similar uh, uh, policy or similar strategy. But, you know, uh, the two different strategies, two different policies at the same region by two powerful countries. It means that uh, it means that they are in the verge of divergence. They are not converging. They have their own policies. How it will affect that relation is is, is another discussion. But for right now, what I'm trying to argue is uh, different policies by different global powers means that they, they are not discussing uh, regarding those reasons. They are not talking about those reasons. That's what uh, I'm trying to say. So let's move to important part in which we'll try to conclude uh, how these two level, how these three levels of analysis uh, impacts uh, uh, U.S.-China relations. I am uh, I'm concluding that it will diverge the United States and China relations because uh, from the from the uh, from the individual level after Joe Biden uh, at <laughs> sorry at, <laughs> sorry at the individual level the win of Biden will fulfill the global vacuum create trusted with allies and relieve the global governance. So it will, it will fulfill the vacuum. It was there when President Trump was the, 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 the president was uh, Trump in the United States. So, you know, China could not easily move to that place right now. Now it will have to go through some rifts. There will be some, some rifts between United States and China because China, United States is already uh, there and it's coming back again. So at the, at the state level, United States is working on institutionalizing the sensitive areas of China. The Congress is on the way to form laws so that the whole state machinery can enact in a particular undivided way towards those sensitive areas. It will help to create a synonymity over Americans as Congress comprise both Republicans and Democrats. So what basically it, uh, it means is they are trying to create synonymity to how to look at China. That's what uh, uh, United States is trying to do regarding at the state level and at the at the systemic level military confrontation and in, are increasing unipolar america world has a challenger and the usa does not seem to share the power right now uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't agree it doesn't agree to the political and economic organization of an emerging of the emerging power so it doesn't agree with that so the individual approach taken by biden will also have systemic effects so I'm in the verge of conclusion that uh, gradually it will move towards divergence. It's moving towards divergence and it will further move towards divergence from the individual state and systemic level of analysis. So what will happen move ahead? So there will be divergence. So what will happen then? So will divergence lead to conflict? So there are basically three areas that needs to be considered before we, before we, uh, before we understand whether it will lead to conflict or not, or let's say war or not. So basically the three areas that needs to be considered is can USA get out of its domestic mess? So how well USA can manage domestic issues now? The first, uh, the, the economic issues, the, 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 the issue between people to people relations and the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the, the issue, the 
because of this COVID-19 pandemic, how President, how well President Biden could bring United States out of these domestic issues. It will also determine how Biden might strongly appear in the international front. So it's a very fundamental thing that, that will impact the global politics now. The United States domestic politics is very important for the global politics at this period of time. So can US-China find common areas of cooperation? As I said earlier, there are different policies, different strategies for the same reason and for the same issues because they are not talking, they are not discussing with each other. So, or they are not agreeing with each other. So there is divergence. So can US and China find a common areas of cooperation? That's a fundamental uh, thing that will that will direct how US China divergence will move ahead. Will the divergence escalate or will it de-escalate? And the more and the third important part is how will China react? Will it be a negotiating China or will it be a confronting China? Will it be a uh, will it be a hawkish China or will it be a dovish China? That's that that is uh, what will impact uh, the way ahead. And uh, uh, a negotiating China means negotiation be between both economic and political front, which is against the individual approach of C. So it's it's very uncertain. It's very hard to say right now. But uh, how China will move ahead will have a significant impact on how that divergence will uh, will further move ahead. Will it escalate or will it de-escalate? So for now, I think the divergence would be silent because a very experienced uh, political leader is will lead the United States for a for a certain period of time. If uh, quote unquote lead the United States for a certain period of time, so 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 it will be a silent divergence because the relationship with China will not be a factor of populism. It will not be a factor of personal gain. So it will it will it might be a silent divergence. And a lot of non-state actors might work at the background. They will start talking. They will start negotiating. But right now, divergence is unavoidable uh, with all these three levels of analysis. So how will it impact the developing world? It's quite important for us who, which, who come from the developing world because it will make the international system uncertain because the global powers are uncertain among the relationship between them. So there is a rift between them. And security will... Uh, overlap over development so it, it it basically means that countries will prioritize security oh sorry over development it will impact the development priority of developing countries the uncertain international system will devise confusing domestic policies the countries will not be able to enact strong economic and social policies are, are because the they are quite dependent on a regional and global affairs and global policies. For example, I would like to give an example of Nepal. Nepal's economic policy is basically dependent on the Middle East policy because a lot of people work in Middle East uh, uh, for remittance. And the Middle East is uh, eventually decided by how China and United States uh, interact or China and United States cooperate with each other because uh, both of them are the producers and consumers uh, of the economy, uh, of the outcome of economy of the Middle East. So this is how domestic policies of uh, developing countries are uh, dependent on the on the policies or relations between powerful countries. So this confusion in domestic policies might uh, rise domestic political confrontation in developing countries as well. So rifts and uncertainty between the global powers might bring rise of domestic political confrontation at the developing and third world as well. Oh, this ends my presentation today. Uh, thank you for your patience and the opportunity as well. Now the floor is open for questions, feedbacks, comments. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Professor Atkahari? Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Jalen. I agree. The presentation was really good. Um, cool. China US relations will deteriorate into a cold war that we saw in the between the US and the USSR. Do you I'm, think that's very likely? I'm sorry, uh, so Professor, did you hear Mark's question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I'm wrong, he asked that uh, is a Cold War likely situation in the United States and China in future? Is it what he's trying to say? Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
I think uh, Cold War is not a likely situation right now because it, it depends on, as I said earlier, it depends on the domestic policies and how China will, uh, will respond to the policies. It's, it's yet to see. Cold War will not be the portion because uh, as uh, uh, Democrats would be leading the uh, cheer in the United States, it, it, it uh, makes a, a basic sense that uh, uh, the confrontation might end at some level, but it actually depends in, uh, in, in the three basic uh, things that I just said in the, in the slide. And uh, I personally think uh, Cold War uh, will not be the result right now because the economic engagement of China is not uh, as closed as USSR was in the 1950s. China has already participated in the global economic system. So economy as a tool for negotiation of political and strategic issues might not work here. So I think uh, Cold War is, is, is quite far away. All right, thank you. That was a good question, Mark. Does anyone else have a question? I see some people in the chat here. Um, someone here mentioned that um, they appreciate your explanation on how Trump has pushed tensions between the US and China. Um, and you think that uh, now with a new, um, a new executive in the White House, you think that all of a sudden the tensions, uh, Professor, are, are suddenly going to be undone between the two countries, or do you think there's going to be some residual tensions there? Uh, th thank you very much for the question. I think uh, uh, Joe Biden's presidency at an individual level, at, as a president, it will not uh, be uh, a sufficient uh, analysis to, to, to predict US and China relations, because I just said, and there are a lot of acts going on in the U.S. Congress, so uh, so those acts make a difference in United U.S. and China relations. And there are systemic factors as well. Uh, the the role of uh, the role of power dissipation and the and the role of international institutions those also make a difference. So I I I think uh, uh, Biden's policy uh, will not uh, uh, will not be. Uh, will not be sufficient enough to 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 bring United States and China together, or, or to mend the uh, gap between United States and China. There are other factors uh, like uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Congress and the Chinese political party and Xi Jinping's ideas towards international affairs and systemic issues that might play a role. I understand. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I know it's very in, early in the morning for Professor Adhikari and you have your whole day ahead of you now. So we thank you for joining us this early. Does anyone else have any questions or comments before we conclude? You're getting, I don't know if you're reading the chats over here, Professor, but you're getting good, good feedback from our students. Oh, thank um, you. Actually, I, I'm not able to see that. I, I don't know why. No. Hmm. They're saying very good things about the way you've explained this. So does anyone else have any questions or comments? Uh, I have one. Please. Um, so recently, I know there's been a lot of border conflict between China and India. Do you see any like potential uh, US involvement in that in the future? And maybe that will harm US-China relations? uh it's it's a very good question thank you thank you for raising this issue uh if you uh, if you if you followed the news recently united states and india went through a two plus two dialogue and they recently had done some agreement agreements regarding uh, military exchanges and naval exercises in the indian ocean region so uh it, it makes sense. It makes sense. There might be some. Uh, there might be some role of United States in that region. And the Indo-Pacific strategy itself is uh, is the idea that centers uh, around India. And since India has uh, issues, border issues with China, you know, Pakistan is one important factor that we should not miss in in in, in this in this in this game. Um, Pakistan and China do not go uh, with good relations, and Pakistan is a very good ally of. Uh, uh, China. 
the peace and friendship treaty between China and Pakistan states that any threat to Pakistan will be considered as a threat to China. So the uh, United States might move in. That's, that's how it's very really hard to say right now, but the recent two plus two dialogue that happened in New Delhi and uh, uh, Dr. Jay Sankar, the foreign minister of uh, India, his speech also connotates that uh, United States and India might align might uh, align in this uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. So it makes sense. Thank you for raising that issue. It makes sense. Yeah, thank you for you. Okay, uh, time for one more question, if anyone has one. Just one more, if there's anyone. Okay. Well, I wanna thank you very much, Professor, for coming and talking with us this evening. This was a real treat to have somebody here from so far across the world come speak with us. So we do appreciate your participation this evening. I would like to thank all the students and faculty and staff who joined us this evening. Um, and we are recording this, so we will be uploading this to GSW TV. Um, so if you have any friends that are interested in this topic um, and they've missed this event, um, this should be on GSW TV within the next day or two. I'll be emailing this over to um, the gentleman who's in charge of that. Okay. Again, thank you, Professor Atkahari. It was a pleasure having you here with us. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, students, for your time. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Uh, good morning from my side. <laughs> oh, good morning. <laughs> you have a good day. We're all going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.